Thank you very much, Chris, for the invitation. I'm um, delighted to be here. <coughs> it's also very nice to see the kinds of interactions between philosophy and this department. Um, when Chris asked me to speak a few weeks ago, I thought it might be interesting to take a look at Nerda's theorem, a famous theorem that relates symmetries with conservation principles. And I think, thought this became even more timely when I came across, well, I, I read John Baez's blog, partly because he is an extraordinarily good scientific communicator, and partly because a lot of stuff on the blog is related to climate change, which has become an interest of mine. Um, and one of the recent um, blogs has to do with a result that he and Brendan Fogg have developed, which is an analog of Nerda's first theorem, the kind that I'll mention in just a moment that it holds in quantum mechanics, the analog this time being in what's called stochastic mechanics, which is a theory, sort of a generalized stochastic dynamics, systems that are really sort of probability distribution type states that evolve over time according to a master equation, which involves a sort of a non-invertible Markov semi-group structure. And in that, in that um, kind of mechanics, you can likewise derive what looks very much like the Noether theorem in, in quantum mechanics. So let me just quickly remind you what Noether's theorem is taken to mean in this particular instance in ordinary quantum mechanics. Well, if we have a Hamiltonian H that describes the evolution of the system, by which I mean we have states which satisfy the equation IH bar D by DT of psi equals H psi of T. This is just the time dependent Schrodinger equation. But then for any observable O, and this is a that's represented by a self adjoint operator in the Hilbert space. Here I'm referring to finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. If O commutes with H, then for all states that satisfy the Schrodinger equation, this holds if and only if V by dt. The mean value of that operator, of that observable, is equal to zero. In other words, the mean value, which we can write like this, function of t, the mean value of this operator is a constant in time, over time. It's a conserved quantity. Now, You'll remember that Noether originally established a relationship between symmetries and conservation principles, and you may ask yourself, well, what's the symmetry? What do, sym what do physicists, generally speaking, mean by symmetries? They mean transformations of relevant observables. Once you have something like an equation of motion, you mean transformations that preserve the form of that equation, or in other words, transformations that take solutions of that equation into solutions. What does that have to do with that? Well, of course, in quantum mechanics, we can associate with self adjoint operators such as O and H. We can associate one parameter continuous groups of unitary transformations. This is essentially through Stone's theorem. And operators therefore become what's sometimes called generators of, of transformation. So, for example, take the case of um, let's say the, t the time dependent free Schrodinger equation for a free particle. The, if we're interested in the momentum P of that particle, that's the generator of time of spatial translations. And the Schrodinger equation is form invariant under rigid displacements of the coordinate system, that's to say, displacements, rigid displacements in space. The Schrodinger equation does not pick out a privileged place in space. And that's related to the conservation of energy, the mean value of, of I think, apart from momentum, because the momentum is the generator of sp spatial translations. It's not the case that all operators are generators of symmetries. In fact, the number of 
observables in quantum mechanics that are associated with symmetries is rather small. This isn't quite the way I read it in, um, in Baez's discussion in his blog, but I, I won't dwell on that point. But I'll come back to another point later. At, at one stage, Baez says that a symmetry is associated with this transformation that takes states into states, and so in particular, isometries is, are symmetries because they preserve the inner product and therefore they preserve the normalization of the state, the norm of the state. But we're going to see a little bit later that that's probably too strong a condition. Symmetries need not necessarily take states into states. I'll, I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, this theorem, very important theorem in quantum mechanics, and its analog in, in stochastic mechanics, <coughs> the analog that Brendan Fong and John Baez developed, I would say is consistent with the spirit of Noether's original theorem, but not its letter. And I'll try to say what I mean by that. There is a very um, important literature on versions of Noether's theorem, not just in quantum mechanics, but more generally, that have nothing to do with Lagrangian systems. But Noether's original work had to do with dynamics that have a Lagrangian formulation. And so her original work was part of a, an exercise in the calculus of variations that have explicitly to do with Lagrangian systems. And, we, and I haven't mentioned any kind of Lagrangian here. So this, in a sense, as I say, is consistent with the spirit of Noether's theorem, but original work, but not with the, with the letter. That isn't supposed to be taken as a criticism, because as I say, there's quite a large literature on variations of the Noetherian theme outside of Lagrangian dynamics. So what I'm going to say is connected with a number of papers that I've written um, <coughs> with Catherine Brading, Peter Holland, and there's a very nice recent um, <coughs> sort of review paper on the meaning of Noether's theorems in the Studies in the History and Philosophy of Modern Physics by Sheldon Smith. So what I really want to do today is just to go backwards and consider the contributions that Noether himself made and put them into some sort of historical and conceptual context. Noether died in 1935, two years after she went to the United States. Of course, she was forced to leave Germany, Göttingen, um, in 1933 as a result of the persecution of the Jews in academia and elsewhere, of course. She ended up in Bryn Mawr University in the United States, but she could have ended up here in Somerville College. Somerville College, the head of Somerville College, was actually actively interested in, in taking her as a, as, a, as a fellow of the college. But I, I, I don't quite understand what happened, but in the case of both Bryn Mawr and Somerville, they were trying to get the Rockefeller Foundation to stump up the salary in the first instance. And in the end, Bryn Mawr won out. But it could have, sister, it could have been other way. She could have been a Oxford Don. At any rate, unfortunately, she only lived two more years. She died after, due to complications after a tumor operation. Um, she was clearly a very remarkable woman. She was a great mathematician. Herman Weil, a few days after her death, there was a commemoration ceremony at Bryn Mawr University, and he, he said that he described her. She was not clay pressed by the artistic hands of God into a harmonious form, but rather a chunk of human primary rock into which he had blown his creative breath of life. Lee Smolin told me once that when Einstein read this phrase, he turned to Vile and said, but you're not exactly a picture postcard either. <laughs> let me just, let me refer to when Nota first went to Bryn Mawr, there were still funding problems, and I think more applications had to be made to funding agencies, and I think in particular the Rockefeller Foundation. And amongst the people writing for her was Norbert Wiener, and this is what he had to say, Ms. Noether is a great personality, the greatest woman mathematician who has ever lived. The greatest woman scientist of any sort now living, and a scholar at least on the plane of Madame Curie. Leaving all questions of sex aside, she is one of the 10 or 12 leading mathematicians of the present generation in the entire world, and has founded what is certain to be the most important close-knit group of mathematicians in Germany, the modern school of algebraists. <coughs> 
Even after she was deprived of her position in Germany on every country of her sex, race, and liberal attitude, numbers of students, men as well as women, continued to meet at her rooms for mathematical instruction. Of all the cases of German refugees, whether in this country or elsewhere, that of Miss Nerdy should be, without doubt, the first to be considered. So her reputation before her death is very, very large, and of course, in mathematics itself, she's much, much more famous for her pioneering work in algebra, commutative and non-commutative commutative ring theory, group theory, group representation theory, and so on, than her work that we're going to be discussing today. What we're going to be looking at today is work that Noda did in 1918 um, that was essentially devoted to issues, problems, that Hilbert, David Hilbert and Felix Klein were concerned with in relation to the new theory of general relativity of Albert Einstein, and in particular the role of the conservation principles. And the connection between the conservation principles in general relativity, which in and of themselves are rather tricky, and they're unlike other conservation principles in non-gravitational physics, and the question of general covariance. General covariance, of course, is a symmetry of general relativity. It's a symmetry unlike the symmetries in standard, the standard physics of non-gravitational interactions. It's a sort of local symmetry, not a global symmetry. I'll come back to this distinction a little bit later. And there were, there were issues about how to understand the emergence of, of conservation principles and whether or not, in Hilbert's words, they were proper or improper conservation principles. I, I don't really want to get into this now, but I just wanted to mention that Nerta's work in 1918 was really concerned not with the what's sometimes called the first theorem that relates conservation principles and symmetries. These symmetries are global symmetries, but what she was really interested in were local symmetries like general covariance. And there there's no straightforward connection between symmetries and conservation principles. But there is what's sometimes referred to as Noda's second theorem, and I'll come back to that at the very end of the talk if there's time. But what I want to do today is to concentrate on the first, the more famous theorem, which has consecrated her name and Noda's name in physics ever since 1918. Well, John Byers again. And amazing, this is his description of Noda's 1918 theorem, the first theorem. An amazing result, which lets physicists get conserved quantities from symmetries of the laws of nature. This result, proved in 1915 by Minerta, shortly after she first arrived in Göttingen, was praised by Einstein as a piece of penetrating mathematical thinking. It's now a standard workhorse in theoretical physics. Actually, I think Einstein was probably referring to the to the, um, to the work on local symmetries rather than global symmetries. And we'll see why, because Einstein himself anticipated a special case of Noda's second theorem in 1916 in relation to general relativity. Letterman and Hill, in a <coughs> well-known review paper, certainly one of the most important mathematical theorems ever proved in guiding the development of modern physics, possibly on a par with the Pythagorean theorem. Praise indeed. But, <clears throat> this was not a new result. The systematic connection between symmetries and conservation principles had already been recognized by Lagrange, Hamilton, Jacobi, Jacobi, and Poincaré. And in particular, even in the beginning of the 19th century, I mean, in Noda's era, detailed treatments of the Lorentzian group symmetries and the Galilean group symmetries had been given by by commentators. What is it that Noerta did that was new? It was Noerta's analysis was more universal, was more general. Um, but it was not something that the idea of connecting symmetries and conservation principles in the air. So let's take a look at Noerta's program. And just again to stress this difference, I'm sure it's familiar to you. I mentioned before the fact that the fundamental equations of physics, at least for the non-gravitational interactions, quantum mechanics in particular, don't pick out a privileged place in space. 
So, for example, if you write down Schrodinger's equation with respect to a particular chord, inertial coordinate system, if you shift that coordinate system by some rigid amount in space, so a rigid transformation, translation of the coordinate system, the Schrodinger equation is form invariant under that transformation. It takes the same form in the new coordinate system, which is just another way of saying that the Schrodinger equation doesn't pick out any privileged place in space. Similarly, of course, with other other such symmetries, that's to say, time translation invariance. The Schrodinger equation, if you do a transformation of the, of the state by some rigid amount in time, once again, the Schrodinger equation takes the form of different times. It doesn't pick out a privileged epoch. Or, what about angles in space? Again, the Schrodinger equation, along with virtually all the equations governing the fundamental non-gravitational directions, um, even in classical mechanics, don't pick out a privileged direction. So in other words, a rotation of the coordinate system is also a symmetry of the equations of motion. So nothing, the, the fundamental equations don't pick out a privileged direction. But all of these cases of symmetries involve transformations that have, as it were, a rigid sense to them. I rotate by a rigid amount, I translate by a rigid amount, I translate in time by a fixed amount. Those quantities don't depend themselves on space and time. Of course, they can vary in value. All of these are continuous symmetries. Noether's theorem applies only to continuous symmetry. It does not apply, for example, to the parity transformation or time re reversal. These are discrete symmetries. So Noether's theorem applies to continuous symmetries. But the point is that once you've chosen the value of the relevant parameter, the shift, as it were, and say in space, that particular shift doesn't vary from point to point in space-time. So these are called global symmetries and, as I say, rotations, translations, and boosts, of course. Galileo's famous ship experiment. The Schrodinger equation, for example, is form invariant under a Galilean transformation of the coordinates, plus, by the way, a very important phase factor transformation, non-local phase factor transformation on the wave function. So a combination of a, of, a, of a local phase factor on the wave function plus the Galilean transformations leads to the form invariance of the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent equation. So these are all examples of global symmetries, again global phase in quantum mechanics. Multiply the, the, the wave function by a global phase factor, one that doesn't depend on space, your position in space and time. And of course, that's the symmetry of the, the Schrodinger equation. And as we'll see, all of these symmetries are associated with conservation principles through Noether's theorem. So this is the subject of Noether's first theorem. But then we have the local symmetries, and of course, examples of these are gauge invariants and electromagnetism, for example, where the, the gauge transformation does depend on, on functions which are functions of space and time. And similarly, general covariance. We have shifts in our coordinate systems that themselves depend on spatiotemporal locations. Now, I put in here the specter of underdetermination because whenever you have a theory that has a local symmetry, you're going to, you're going to have a prima facie problem with the initial value problem. Because if you set up, your, for example, your conditions on some hyperservice, space like hyperservice, and you want to read off the future, by solving the equations of motion, or read off the past for that matter, then you can introduce, once you have a solution that's, that, that gives you the future evolution of the system, you can introduce a, um, one of these local transformations. Remember, because it's a symmetry, it maps solutions into solutions, but because these things are local, they can be the identity on the initial conditions and different elsewhere. So you can have the same initial conditions, but different solutions propagating into the future. And this looks like a breakdown of determinism. Well, it's an underdetermination is a better way of putting it. It doesn't mean that the, the dynamics is stochastic. It simply means that your partial differential equations don't give you unique solutions um, in the initial value problem. And of course, this is something that puzzled Einstein when he was developing general relativity. The story of general covariance is a fascinating one in the development of general relativity because, first of all, it impeded. Einstein knew that he, he wanted his, his field equations to be generally covariant. 
If I have time later, I'll say why he was so confused about this, but he was heading in the right direction. So much of general relativity um, was the result of Einstein heading in the right direction for the wrong reasons. And this was certainly a case in point. He somehow wanted the, the, the field equations to be general covariant. He gave lots of arguments for this, for the, probably too many arguments for general covariance. But then he suddenly came up against this problem of underdetermination, and it prevented it, it stopped him from publishing his field equations for, I think, something like a year. Until, of course, he realized the same thing is happening in general relativity as in electromagnetism. And that's simply that the, this, all of these solutions that are gauge-related, or related by diffeomorphisms in the case of general relativity, are all really saying one and the same thing. They're diff different representations of the same reality, but this was not obvious. This was not obvious at the time. Einstein spent a year trying to sort this out. This is the famous whole argument in the foundations of general relativity. But we're not interested in that today. We want to look at Noda's variational problem. Now this is going, this slide and the next slide are going to be general enough to cover both, both the local and the global transformation symmetries. Suppose we have some kind of system of fields, which are represented by these phi's. The i is an index that just tells you either they're components of fields or they're different kinds of fields. And we have our spatiotemporal coordinates. We have a, a system of these fields that is subject to Lagrangian dynamics, which means we have a Lagrangian density. We have an action, which is the integral of some four-dimensional region in space-time. Let's just remind ourselves what we mean by Hamilton's principle, because one of the things I want to stress is that Noda's variational problem looks a little bit like Hamilton's principle, but it's subtly different. Remember how it goes with Hamilton's principle. You have this action functional here of the fields. The Lagrangian itself will assume, is a, it, let's just assume for the sake of implicity, it's a function of the fields and their first derivatives. But it could be second or higher derivatives. It doesn't really matter. And the idea is that the fields themselves evolve in such a way that this, this action is extremized. And what you mean by that is that you introduce arbitrary infinitesimal variations in the field values, which you assume those variations vanish on the boundary of your region of integration. Okay? And you demand that the um, first order variation in the action as a result of that transformation, those variations in the, the values of the fields, is zero, subject to this condition that the variations vanish on the boundary. And out will pop there are the Lagrange equations, the field, in other words, the field equations, okay? That's, the, that's Hamilton's principle. Now, again, it depends on arbitrary infinitesimal variations of the fields themselves, the so-called dependent variables. Put that aside. Let's think of a different variational problem. Now the variational problem is the following. We're going to choose specific transformations, not arbitrary transformations, specific ones. Remember, our symmetries are not just willy-nilly transformations, they're usually described by a particular Lie group. So we're looking at a particular infinitesimal, a specific set of infinitesimal transformations that hold both for the coordinates and for the fields. Not just, in other words, the independent and the dependent variables. Now generally speaking, we're interested in the case where if you know what these are, the variations here, you know what the variations here are, because these will be tensorial objects, and tensors you may regard as being defined by the way that their components change under an arbitrary change of the coordinate system. And now we're not going to insist that these variations vanish on the boundary, of the that this is an arbitrary region of, of, of integration. And we're not going to assume necessarily that these variations vanish on the boundary. But for these specific variations, we are going to insist, Noether insisted, that this variation, this first order variation in the action, comes about by varying the, these, these variables in the Lagrangian, vanishes. So it's, it's not Hamilton's principle, but something rather close to it. Now, just to complicate things a little bit, um, you'll recall that when you do Lagrangian dynamics, the Lagrangian 
is only defined up to a total divergence term. In other words, you take any Lagrangian for a set of fields and you add a divergence term to the Lagrangian density, it's not going to make any difference to the Euler Lagrange equations that come out in the end using Hamilton's principle. So if you like, the Lagrangian has a kind of a gauge freedom. It's this total divergence term. And in the end, because of that freedom in the Lagrangian, it turns out that to make sense of this variational principle, Noether shouldn't really have said that the first order variation in the action should be zero. It should be zero up to a divergence term. Well, up to the integral of the divergence, so in other words, a boundary term. This is just a technical detail. Don't worry if it's not familiar to you. Noether herself, in her original 1980 paper, more or less anticipated this. And this, this became standard in, in later accounts of Noether's theorem. So now we're going to, we've got these very specific transformations on both the coordinate. We, there could be situations where it's merely the fields, or a combination of the coordinates and the fields. But this is the fact that the, that the first order variation in the action vanishes up to a, to a surface term that places a constraint on the dynamics. That's going to be a constraint on the dynamics. What does it look like? Well, you just do the calculus of variations. Oh, I should just, before I forget, Noether never used the word symmetry. This is a problem in it's what's called invariant theory, invariant theory in the calculus of variations. It doesn't use the word symmetry ever in a paper. And the question is, by the way, which I'll come back to in a minute, what does all of this have to do with transformations that take the Euler Lagrange equations into the Euler, I mean, transformations that take solutions of the Euler Lagrange equations into solutions of the Euler Lagrange equations. That's what a physicist means by symmetry. That's a dynamical symmetry. Things that preserve the form of the Schrodinger equation. What does that have to do with all of this? And I'll come back to that. So, anyway, you, you just you, you plug that constraint in. You do the calculus of variations, and what you end up getting is what might be called the Noether condition, which is just that you remember that if you apply Hamilton's principle, you end up getting this Euler Lagrange expression here, sometimes called the Euler expression, that vanishes as a result of Hamilton's principle, and those are just the field equations. Okay, so this this particular form here, functional of the of the Lagrangian, and that vanishes because of Hamilton's principle. So I'm going to use this term E to represent this Euler expression that vanishes according to Hamilton's principle. But for the moment, we're not applying Hamilton's principle. We're just using the Noether variational problem. And what we find is that we get on the left-hand side a linear combination of these Euler expressions, where the coefficients are what's called the form variations, or the lead drags of the fields themselves. So normally when you, when you describe the variation in the field, you have the new value of the field at the new space-time point minus the old value of the field at the old space-time point. But the form variation is the new value of the field at a, at a space-time point minus the old value of the field at that same space-time point. So this is, these are the coefficients in this linear combination of the Euler expressions. And the right-hand side is a complicated total divergence. That's the, that's the Noether condition. Now, if we go to the first theorem, these variations, infinitesimal variations in the coordinates, we're interested in ones which are linear in some parameters. So, for example, if I'm doing a spatial translation, I fix the parameter that determines the spatial translation, and these infinitesimal variations will be linear in those parameters. Of course, I, this is an omega k here. The index here represents maybe, in the case of a translation, it represents the vectorial indices. So the components of the, of the vector that represents the translation. So there'll be three of them. And similarly, the variations in the fields, this, this form variation, will be a linear will be linear in these, in these specified parameters that represent the symmetry in question, whether it's a translation in space or a rotation or a boost. Of course, a boost will involve a velocity, which again is a vector, so it has three components, and so on. And this is just the term that, that appeared sort of magically in that divergence 
the kind of gauge freedom of Lagrangian. And that will also be linear in these parameters. And when you plug this into that Noether condition, remember I said it was a linear combination of the Euler expressions equal to a total divergence. This is what you get out. So what's the connection with what's the connection with a conservation principle? Well, we would like the left hand side of this condition to vanish. Because the right hand side is a total divergence. And when a total divergence vanishes in four dimensions, I mean I'm assuming that just for the sake of argument, this mu here um, is a spatio-temporal index that goes from zero to three. In the case, the, the usual cases we're interested in, this is going to be a continuity equation in physics. Now, a continuity equation normally tells you that when you've got a system of fields or particles or mass in general, it's evolving over time. If you take an infinitesimal region, the flux of the stuff emerging from that region is the same as the flux going into it. In other words, you don't get any creation or annihilation of, of, of matter, the field stuff. So it's a bit like a conservation principle. You're not quite there yet. But, but um, continuity equations are terribly important in physics as representing the fact that we don't have creation and annihilation of matter. So we're going to get something that looks like a continuity equation if we can make the left-hand side vanish. Now, there are two ways you can do this. One is you just apply Hamilton's principle. Because if Hamilton's principle are true for all of these fields, then the E's are, by hypothesis, zero. So if all of these fields are dynamical and satisfy Hamilton's principle, which means that they satisfy the Euler Lagrange equations, all of these terms here are zero, and we immediately get a continuity equation. But of course, that's not the only way. It could well be that some of these vanish, so some of the fields are dynamical. Maybe some of them aren't. But then there's still the possibility that this term vanishes. And there are interesting cases in the literature, uh, just to give you a sort of a, a feel for it. Suppose you do electrodynamics in Minkowski space-time, where you include the metric field as a field. So you have the Minkowski metric built into your field theory. Now, it's a funny way to go about it, but if you want to do everything generally covariant, this is what you would do. So you would have you would have the metric appearing, but of course the metric is not dynamical in Minkowski space-time. It doesn't satisfy all the Lagrange equations. It's an absolute background structure. But of course it has symmetries. There are killing vectors. And because of those killing vectors, this thing that's associated with the Euler-Lagrange, the Euler expression associated with the metric doesn't vanish, but this term does. So you still end up getting your, your continuity equation for the fields in Minkowski space time. That's not quite where we want to get to. We want to get to a situation where something is actually preserved over time, conserved over time, and then what you do is you take your continuity equation, however you got it from Nerdus theorem, whether because all the fields are dynamical and satisfy Hamilton's principle, or because maybe there are killing vectors or something, you integrate it over, t over um, the whole of space, you get a term you essentially get put an integral over here, you can pull out the d by dt. The integral of a divergence is a surface term. And if you have the appropriate boundary conditions, if the fields and maybe their derivatives fall off fast enough with distance, the spatial integral of this term, because of Gauss's theorem, it's a surface term, will become as small as you like. So what you're left with if you have the appropriate boundary conditions, and, and normally these boundary conditions are perfectly reasonable. You end up with d by dt of this, of this term here with the scalar is equal to zero. And so you've ended up with a conserved quantity. Sorry that it's so abstract. But I thought I'd just go through it quickly to show how the theorem works. So you end up what's sometimes referred to as conserved charges. Okay. So you can see now how in the case of these global symmetries, and these are the, the global parameters that fix the nature of these symmetry transformations, you can end up getting, if you have the appropriate, if you have the appropriate boundary conditions, you can end up getting terms which are preserved over time. These are inter integrals of properties of the fields 
integrals over space, and those things remain constant over time. I'll come back to an example in a short way. Well, what does notice first then really mean? I mean, of course, we've seen the mathematics. What, what, is it, what is it really telling us? Well, I think it's probably fair to say that there's a traditional view. Um, it's sort of hinted at in that um, statement by John Byers that I, that I mentioned before, um, which goes something like this. Um, this is what Bas van Frassen, a well-known philosopher of science, says, in the 20th century we have learned to say that every symmetry yields a conservation law. Symmetries engender conservation law. There's a, there's, a, there's a notion of something being, that symmetries are fundamental, conservation laws are, are a consequence of the symmetries. In Landau and Lifshitz, their book on mechanics, there are some quantities whose constancy is of profound significance, deriving from the fundamental homogeneity and isotropy of space and time. So, for example, if you, get, if you take the homogeneity of space, the fact that the equations of motion don't change their form when you go from place to place, that gives rise to the conservation of linear momentum. If you take the isotropy of space, the fact that the equations don't pick out a privileged direction, you get the conservation of angular momentum. And if you take time translation invariance, the fact that the equations take the same form at all epochs, you get the conservation of energy. Now, I'm not sure that everybody who's ever studied Nerdist theorem or thought about Nerdist theorem really holds that the symmetries are somehow more fundamental than conservation principles, but maybe we should step back and say, wait a sec, let's think about this a bit more. There is a point of view according to which the symmetries really are no more fundamental than the conservation principles, neither accounts for the other, and the connection is not one-to-one. -one. So, for the rest of the, of this talk, I'll, I'll say something about the subtleties involved in interpreting Nerdist's first theorem. Here's an example from quantum mechanics. Now, this is, this is a case of the application of Nerdist's theorem in quantum mechanics that's very different from the one we saw before. It's actually taking the wave function as a field. It's considering the time-dependent free evolution equation, this thing here, the Schrodinger equation with the free particle, as an Euler Lagrange equation. So we're starting with this Lagrangian approach, which was basic to Nerda's own work. And it turns out that you can write down a Lagrangian for the free particle. It gives you the Schrodinger equation as the Euler Lagrange equation, if you apply Hamilton's principle, for variations with respect to the wave function, its complex conjugate, and the, and the wave function itself. In other words, you treat the wave function and its complex conjugate as independent fields. You vary each of them. And it turns out, interestingly, that if you vary the complex conjugate, you get, as the Euler-Lagrange equation, the Schrodinger equation for psi. If you vary psi and apply Hamilton's principle, you get the Schrodinger equation for phi star, the complex conjugate. But that's just the way it goes. Now the question is, is there some kind of symmetry? Because you, if you look at this equation, you should realize that this equation is a continuity equation. Okay? It is actually a continuity equation. So it's d by dt of something is equal to a divergence. What's the corresponding symmetry? Well, here's a symmetry. It's a very unusual one, a note of variation. Its psi goes to psi prime, so we take a wave function, complex valued wave function, and simply add an arbitrary constant complex number to it. This is an example of a transformation that does not take a state into a state, because it doesn't preserve the square integrability of the wave function. But Nerda doesn't care. Nerda is interested in variations that have a mathematical basis, and then you see what happens. So if you introduce this, this of course is a global symmetry because I'm specifying a particular constant that doesn't depend on space and time. And if I put that into the <coughs> machinery and grind it all through, it turns out that the Noda continuity equation is just my original equation. It's just a Schrodinger. 
I don't think you understand this any complex number, what you, because the wave function is not, not, not a number. Wave the, function is, the, wave, the wave function, this is a single particle, mm -hmm. so the wave function is defined on space, mm -hmm. not configuration, well, it's the configuration space of one particle, which is space, okay, and it assigns a complex number to every point in space. Okay. So I'm just adding a, okay, okay, I'm just okay, adding okay, a yeah. complex number to it. Okay. And it turns out that because of, this is, this is a symmetry of this equation, okay, it should be obvious because you've got derivatives on both sides. It's a symmetry of the equation, and it turns out that if you use the Noether apparatus, it turns out that the continuity equation is the equation you started out with. So sometimes the continuity equation is sort of trivial, in the sense that you, you started with the continuity equation as being your equation of motion, you just get it back again. It turns out, interestingly, that if I was to add here a complex vector, if, if I was to add here a, um, a complex vector dotted with um, the spatial coordinate, I, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, there's something that becomes, um, I better not say, I better not say this because I'll probably get it wrong, but it turns out that there's another very closely related symmetry that also gives you back the same continuity equation, so it's not unique. In other words, when you go backwards, when you do the converse version, you don't get necessarily a unique continuity equation. And by the way, there's a very, very similar situation that holds in classical electro electromagnetism. If you take Maxwell's equations, source-free Maxwell's equations, and you write them in terms of the vector potential, okay, so you do everything from the point of view of the vector potential, it turns out that if you add a constant arbitrary vector field to the vector potential, that's also a symmetry of Maxwell's source-free equations. And the continuity equation itself is Maxwell's equation, because they also form a continuity equation. So this isn't a unique situation to quantum mechanics. Uh, how is this, this other variation? Would this be space dependent? That's what, that was what was bothering me. I was about to say that you multiply it by the spatial coordinate, mm -hmm. which would make it spatially dependent. And that confuses me, because yeah. then it wouldn't be a global symmetry. I'll have, to look at, I'll have to look at who were these people. Yeah, I'll have to look at their paper again. I'll have to look at their paper. If we introduce, if we introduce reasonable boundary conditions on the wave function, and then we ask ourselves, can we get a, a conserved charge? The answer is yes, and it turns out to be just the integral of the wave function. Now, if instead of that symmetry. I had introduced a global phase factor. In other words, I'd replace psi goes to psi prime is equal to e to the i something, which is just a constant, which is a global phase factor. You know that's not going to change anything in quantum mechanics. The wave function is only defined up to a global phase factor. But that's a Noether symmetry. And it turns out, of course, that the Noether charge is the integral of psi squared, just as well, because you know that has to be conserved, otherwise you'd have problems with probability theory in the theory. You wouldn't be able to norm normalize the wave function, etc., in the way you need to, to do proper probability theory. But in this case, because of this symmetry, you get the integral of the wave function itself, which is conserved over time. Incidentally, the question I'd like to ask, those of you who view the wave function as merely epistemic, why should it satisfy a continuity equation when you leave it alone? Because that's, well, that's what the free particle is doing. It's just propagating by itself. No one's acting on it. Left to itself, the equation is a continuity equation. Why should that be? Now, just before I leave this case, suppose I looked at another symmetry, which is a little bit like the global phase factor, but now it's an arbitrary constant, an arbitrary complex number. So this is a multiplicative case. That is clearly a symmetry of the equation because you've got derivatives on both sides. So multiplying the wave function by a complex number won't do anything. It'll still be a solution okay, to that equation. But it's not a Noether symmetry. Because this thing doesn't satisfy Noether's variational problem. In other words, the, the action is not invariant up to a divergence. 
with one of these transformations, unless the modulus of C is equal to 1, and then we're back to the global phase factor case. And we saw that that case works. So here's a case of a symmetry. These things are quite common in physics. You take an equation of motion, and you find that you can rescale the fields. And that doesn't make any difference to, I mean, it takes, if you rescale the fields, you've still got a solution. So you're multiplying by some sort of factor, you still get a solution. But that kind of rescaling is not a nodal symmetry. And it does not lead through this, through this kind of machinery to a conserved charge. Now, here's another interesting case, just to, make, just to show that the, the situation is even a little bit more complicated. There are cases in physics where you have Lagrangian systems, but the Lagrangian not only is not defined up to, it, it's only defined up to a, um, a total divergence, but you can actually find situations where you have alternative Lagrangians that themselves only defined up to a total divergence, but these are not the same as these up to a total divergence. In other words, you have a kind of a, a multiplicity kind of a deep ambiguity in the Lagrangian of the system. One of the simplest cases that I know of it just involves this two-dimensional simple harmonic oscillator. So you've got, you know, a system that's oscillating in this direction and that direction simultaneously. Um, and this is the standard Lagrangian that you see. These are just the coordinates in one direction. Q1 and Q2 is the coordinate in the, in the orthogonal direction. This is the standard Lagrangian in the textbooks. But this is an alternative Lagrangian that gives you exactly the same euler lagrange equations. Okay, so these, this is a case of, of, an, of a kind of an ambiguity in the Lagrangian approach. And now the question is, suppose I take a conserved, these, the equations of motion, the euler lagrange equations that are common to these two Lagrangians, are consistent with the conservation of angular momentum, this guy here. Now the question is, what symmetry is associated with that conservation principle? Well, you're going to begin to see straight away, it depends on which Lagrangian you choose. So in this case here, you do what you expect to do, and you introduce a rotation in the coordinates, a rigid rotation. Just as you normally do when you derive, in, in say, in classical mechanics, generally, or quantum mechanics, when you derive the conservation of angular momentum, you normally think of it as being associated with rigid rotations in space. But in this particular case here, you introduce what's called a squeeze transformation involving these exponential terms. And these are nerdous symmetries of that Lagrangian. And these are nerdous symmetries of that Lagrangian. And these are not nerdous symmetries of that Lagrangian. And these are not nerdous symmetries of that Lagrangian. But you end up with the same result. So in these rather special cases where the Lagrangian there's more ambiguity than just the standard defined up to, a, up to a divergence term. One has to be careful as to exactly what one's supposed to say. It depends on the choice of the Lagrangian. And there are other even more dramatic cases in the literature, which if I have time, maybe I can go back to. So I, I want to sort of summarize, um, just to finish, I want to summarize some of the complications and subtleties. First of all, Wigner, in 1954, reminded us not to be too, um, I forget the term that he used now, um, simple-minded, something like that, about Noether's theorem. Because Noether's theorem itself requires a Lagrangian formulation, a Lagrangian dynamics. Not all systems satisfy Lagrangian dynamics. I mean, all of the systems that are really of interest to us do. But you can ima easily imagine, you can write down examples. Wigner gave one sort of a first order Newtonian type, well actually more Aristotelian dynamics, that's not susceptible to Lagrangian formulation, where you have, um, I can't remember which way around it goes now, I think you have um, time translation variance but no conservation, I can't remember which way it goes now, no conservation of energy, one or the other fails. So in other words, don't think of applying naively, notice theorems are situations that don't have Lagrangian dynamics. I did mention before that there's a literature on notice theorem which transcends Lagrangian dynamics, but of course there are counterexamples to it. Not all symmetries are Noetherian. I just gave you an example of that scaling type symmetry. That doesn't satisfy notice conditions. It's not a Noetherian symmetry, so it won't be associated in her theorem 
with respect to, it won't be associated with a conservation principle. And there are other examples too, not just the scale, the scale examples. The symmetry may not lead to a continuity equation. After all, that on the left-hand side of notice condition, you've got a linear combination of the Euler expressions times these form variations in the, in the fields. And it just may not be that all of your fields are dynamical. Or it may be that the, the, um, well, you, you, the conditions for the left-hand side vanishing, that linear combination may not hold. In which case, you simply don't get a continuity equation. So it's not, a, it's not something that's necessarily automatic just because you have the Lagrangian system and, and Noetherian symmetries. And if you don't have the, the appropriate boundary conditions, again, even if you have a continuity equation, you don't have the appropriate boundary conditions, and there are, there are cases in the literature where the boundary conditions are really not plausible, then you will not get a conserved charge. Uh, the continuity equation itself may be identical to the equations of motion. We saw that in the case of the quantum mechanical example, the nodal symmetry may not carry states into states. So that psi goes to psi prime, which is equal to psi plus c. That doesn't carry states into states, but it's still a perfectly good Noetherian symmetry. So for example, one has to be a little bit careful when one's defining symmetries in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, and then this last point, which symmetry is associated with a given conserved quantity can depend on the choice of the so it's a subtle business, and I just want to finish now just with a sort of a, a last remark about how explanation goes. Here's what's happening with inertia. You start with a variational symmetry. So you've got a Lagrangian system, you introduce these specific variations in the fields and or <coughs> the, um, the, the, the coordinates. You insist that the action is extremized at the first order part of the variation of the action vanishes up to a divergence term. And you can derive usually, I mean assuming the boundary conditions that everything satisfies Hamilton's principle, etc., you can, you can derive a conservation principle. And there is a converse to the theorem. And her herself gave, mentioned this, she, she proved the converse to the theorem. What has that got to do with this notion of dynamical symmetry beloved of physicists? Now remember, a physicist is, is interested not so much in Lagrangians and, and, and actions themselves, but more directly, all of the physics is in the order of Lagrange equations. That's where the physics is. And so what you're interested in are transformations to take solutions of the order of Lagrange equations into solutions. Or in other words, preserve the form them itself of the, of the order of Lagrange equations. This is what we're interested in. What's the connection? Well, it turns out that Virtually all of the time, this is a theorem, if you have an ortho variational symmetry, you will also have a dynamical symmetry. There, is, there are counterexamples, and the counterexamples involve cases of fields where not all of the fields satisfy Hamilton's principle. So a necessary condition in, the, in this derivation to give you what you really want, which is the physicist's notion of a dynamical symmetry, requires that all the fields in that the feature in the Lagrangian satisfy Hamilton's principle, which is a pretty, normally it's a pretty weak condition, particularly if you like the action-reaction principle. And you don't, you don't want to see absolute objects floating around in your dynamics. But look, look where we've got to. We end up with this, and we derive under the ordinary circumstances of concentration principle, and under ordinary circumstances we derive dynamical symmetry. And in a sense, all that we've established is a correlation. It's not that this is more fundamental than that. And by the way, both of these things are mere consequences of the Euler Lagrange equations. You didn't need to know anything about inertia. If you are clever enough, if you just start from the equations of motion, you can derive the existence of dynamical symmetries just as you can derive conservation principles. So why is it that in the literature, we generally tend to see it as being asymmetric? Why is it in the literature that we tend to see inertia going from symmetries to conserved quantities? Now, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but here's a, here's a stab at it. The answer is simply this. In the Lagrangian formalism, Lagrangians wear their symmetries on their sleeves. It's much easier to spot a symmetry of a Lagrangian than to spot a conserved quantity inside the Euler-Lagrange equations. 
And anyway, you might actually be much more concerned when you're developing a new theory to impose the symmetries as a constraint on Lagrangian rather than the conserved quantities. It's just much easier to handle. So within the Lagrangian formalism itself, it's not that these things are somehow intrinsically more fundamental than the conserved quantities. It's just that Lagrangian formalism, because of the way that the symmetries are worn on the sleeve of the Lagrangian, it seems to be more natural to start with the symmetries and end up with them. <coughs> and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Alan, for a very nice talk and excellent time. So now we have a few minutes for questions. I'm sure there are many. Yes. On the last one, I would say that many physicists would say something like isotropy of space is true for many sets of equations of motion. So this is regarded as more fundamental. And that, that's the reason why. But couldn't you say that in all of those in all of those cases the, the conservation of angular momentum is also the case? Of course you could. So if, if it's an inductive argument, it holds doesn't it hold equally well in both cases? I mean after all in the his, in the history of physics, for example, the conservation of energy has often been regarded as a sine qua non for any valid theory in physics. Conservation of energy. If you violate the conservation of energy, you're in trouble. So, you know, people like Lorentz and Poincaré and others, they elevated certain things to the status of principles. And if you violate those principles, you're in serious trouble or you shouldn't be taken seriously. And, and there, conservation principles seem to be at least as prominent as, as symmetries. Uh, your argument seems to involve specialization. What do you actually mean by symmetry? Because you distinguish between variational symmetry and dynamical symmetry. So, so what would you think is in general physical symmetry? A physical that, symmetry is a, the ones that we're interested in physics are these guys. So that, that would be, that would subsume a group theoretic structure? Or well, it just means that, think of Galileo's ship. You do experiments inside the, sh the cabin of a ship. You then put the ship into motion. You repeat the same initial conditions and set up the same experiment again. You get exactly the same results. That's telling you that the laws of physics that govern those what's going on in the laboratory are insensitive to the state of motion of the laboratory. What's that, what's that got to do with variation? So it's operational. It's, it's not just operational. It means that the form of the equ fundamental equations of physics are, that, that form is invariant under certain kinds of transformations. It's what allows it to be operational. It's what allows you to <laughs> say it operational. Exactly so. It's what allows you to say, give the operational thing. This thing is very abstract. And I was struck by the fact that um, you, you can find situations, for example, in the case of the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator is one, for example. If you make one of the the components non-dynamical, so it doesn't doesn't satisfy Hamilton's principle. You can violate this connection. It's it's very artificial, I, I admit, but it's worth pointing out that it's not this this inference here is not strictly automatic. Sounds. So could there be some more general setting that goes beyond the Lagrangian formalism? Uh, well, what extent has that been? Yeah. Well, this is. I mean, th this is a sort of an example. Because it doesn't yeah. have anything to do, you're not using the Lagrangian formula. Right. I mean, so in general, I mean, is there a sort of Heisenberg picture version? Of, uh, uh... It's not so much whether it's Heisenberg or Schrodinger picture. It's just can you can you give an account of a connection between symmetries and conservation principles that transcends the Lagrangian approach? But you're really stepping out of Noda's shoes there. Right. You're doing right. something different. But, but, but the, and there is a literature. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's, so there's, extent, there's, I mean, you say there is an answer to that? Or, uh, I think it depends on the case, but there's certainly a large literature on this. Uh, can, you, can you say again why this multiplication by a constant um, is not a Noetherian uh, symmetry but, but addition of constant laws? Because if you multiply the wave function by an arbitrary complex number, it's obvious because this thing here is going to involve, say, in the case of a free particle, it's going to be p squared over 2m. So it's going to be del squared over 2m. So you've got spatial derivatives here. 
the operator acting on the wave function. You have temporal derivatives here. So multiplying the wave function by a constant number is not going to make any difference. You, the, these, these constants are going to just cancel on both sides. So it's still going to be a solution. But if you go back to that Lagrangian that I wrote down for this equation, for the free particle equation, that transformation doesn't preserve the, it doesn't extremize the, the action. So it's not a Noetherian symmetry. And it, this is typical. I mean, rescaling, when rescaling is a symmetry, it's rarely a Noetherian symmetry. And that's why rescaling doesn't give rise to, to conserved quantities, generally. Do you have some kind of intuition why why Lagrange is so key to this table rather than Hamiltonian? The Hamiltonian has kind of an easier interpretation, but conserved quantity, it's clear thing what it means. Symmetry it sort of has an intuitive interpretation. Lagrange is kind of sort of obscure as opposed to Hamiltonian. Well, that's what I feel. I don't know how to answer that question. I don't have a good intuition on this. We'll take the rest of the discussion down to the common room then. There will be tea and biscuits. And if you're too shy, you have a question now that we didn't get to inform our speaker there. But before that, let's thank him again.